thank you very much for uh, um, inviting me to present. Um, it's very kind, and um, I think there's some useful connections here. So I, as, as introduced, I'm going to be talking about the Scout 2 HydroGNSS microsatellite mission. And um, I will kick off now. So the European Space Agency Scout Programme is a, it's a new initiative from ESA's Earth Observation Directorate. Um, it covers small satellite missions demonstrating uh, science with small budget and rapid schedule. And the missions are fully funded by ESA, characterized by an agile and low cost development process to prove new concepts for future ESA endeavors. And the aim is to tap into new space approach. And it's uh, aimed to achieve a launch within 36 months after kickoff, budget less than 30 million. And it's accepting the higher risks and use of COTS components, um, reuse of existing designs that are used on small satellites. And the data will be free, full and open and delivered using a service-based approach. And Hydrogen SS was selected as one of the first two scout missions in February 2021. So just a bit about how the path to selection. So um, ESA solicited uh, the scout bids um, in 2019 and uh, uh, we met together at a GNSS reflectometry workshop and um, put together the team and the first concept in May 2019. And ESA received um, either 16 or 17 uh, varied proposals um, in August 2019. These were large proposals. Ours was about 800 pages, so there was a lot to sort through, and they were on all kinds of different subjects. Four of these um, concepts were down-selected, including our Hydro GNSS. And then there was a study run for those four concepts from January to August in 2020. And we uh, presented to the ACHIO Advisory Committee um, of, of scientists in October. And uh, then um, the SCOUT um, missions were announced. SCOUT 1 announced in December 2020 and SCOUT 2 announced February 2021. So Hydrogen SS was selected as the um, Scout 2. Um, uh, we have quite a large team um, in Hydrogen SS and we're working closely with the European Space Agency who have their own range of experts and uh, program management as well. SSTL, um, you, most of you will have heard of us, we're a small satellite company, uh, been going for a long time and we are providing the payload platform and ground segment um, and then the science team, Sapienza University of Rome, um, working in soil moisture end-to-end -end simulator, IEC, on working on the GNSS signal processing and the inundation, Finnish Meteorological Institute, working on the freeze-thaw state, Torvegata University um, is working closely with Sapienza on the simulator and the surface interaction simulation. IFAC CNR is working on the forest biomass. And we also have partners, National Oceanography Center, who uh, have experience of ocean-based calibration, University of Nottingham, helping with the GNSS instrumentation and signal processing. And joining us later will be Technical University of Vienna participating in the data fusion study. And we also have a um, science advisory committee that brings further expertise. So GNSS reflectometry um, is, um, it's, using reusing signals that are transmitted by navigation sa satellite systems including gps and galileo there's over a hundred sources of these l-band signals in orbit and what we're doing is we're picking up the forward reflection so it's a kind of bi-static radar and early concepts led to a key in-orbit demonstration on tech demo sat one um, with coi and uksa funding and then after that we started uh, receiving support from esa and uh, the work on TDS showed the sensitivity to ocean wind and wave sensing, sea ice extent, ice concentration, and now land, which is being addressed by Hydrogen SS. So our early work, um, the key demonstrations were UKDMC, um, which first showed that it was possible. TDS carried um, many, um, carried it, uh, actually started processing on board. Um, and then the, that enabled the NASA Cygnus, where we provided the payloads to eight um, satellites. And that really has 
paved the way for uh, GNSS reflectometry. Um, there's a small demonstrator called DOT1 that we're um, operating at the moment, and then Hydro GNSS will be going up in 2024. So hydrological knowledge, um, as, as everyone realizes, is very important um, to humans. Um, it's a vital um, for climate, weather, life on Earth, and um, it's present on or in the land in form of soil moisture, wetlands, rivers, snow and ice and vegetation. The World Economic Forum identifies land water related issues as amongst the greatest challenges facing the population for the future. The knowledge um, is vital for soil moisture, for permafrost um, to do with emissions, biomass, carbon stock and wetlands um, for methane emissions again and biodiversity. And models need measurements for understanding and predictions um, and planning for the future and tackling climate change. So um, for climate, um, often Earth system models are used and for weather forecasting, numerical weather prediction. All um, benefit from assimilating real measurements. Scout hydrogen assess targets um, land parameters linked to essential climate variables. Um, so the Global Climate Observing System specifies 54 essential climate variables for observation of a climate, and 60% of these can be addressed by satellite data. And so the, the targets that we're going for, soil moisture, biomass, and permafrost, and inundation are very closely linked to ECVs. And uh, the mission uses GNSS reflectometry, which is a novel, complementary, and unique sensing technique and it addresses a shortage in L-band measurements. And now I'll show a video which gives the, the concept. Um, I apologize if it's a little bit stuttery, but I hope you get the idea. So this is taking measurements of permafrost, um, the active layer, biomass, soil moisture, and wetlands. Um, and taking measurements of all these things. The way it's done is the signals come from GPS and Galileo constellations as towards 30. And these signals are being broadcast and we were able to pick up reflections and they manifest as um, delayed Doppler maps as shown in the bottom right hand corner. And it works over all weather, it, it works over, uh, over clouds. Um, and it, it, we can pick up signals over land, over ice, over water. And the targets that for hydrogenesis is going for is um, soil moisture, wetlands, biomass, and uh, the freeze-thaw layer, the active layer above uh, permafrost in particular. But it can also be used for measuring ice extent and wind speed over the ocean as secondary products. Now, our original concept was uh, two satellites. And uh, when the two satellites build up their measurements over time, it gradually covers in a kind of quasi random way um, with the reflections cover the earth in um, quite densely over, over fifth, every, every 15 days. So that's a, a video representation of hydrogenesis. And then back to the slides. So looking at each of these four variables that we're targeting and looking at the evidence, um, this is uh, soil moisture. Um, we're very um, lucky to have the, the Cygnus measurements uh, that have provided the, the basis for the evidence. So if you look in this um, plot on the left, you've got the measurements from the SMAP satellite, NASA SMAP soil moisture satellite, and then you've got the measurements from the Cygnus. And Cygnus was designed to target hurricanes over the ocean, but they found that it could take measurements over land and it's been used you can see here to compare against um, SMAP, and it compares very favorably. Um, it's, it's around 1.5 dB sensitivity for 10% soil moisture. Resolution is around 10 to, two to seven kilometers. Um, the resolution gets um, finer as the signal becomes more coherent uh, or flatter surfaces. And it's, um, they have been developing a soil moisture based on, um, just on the low latitudes that Cygnus can access using um, GNSS reflectometry measurements. Now they need higher latitude coverage. Um, dual polarization would help detangle um, the different effects. 
Um, here's the evidence for inundation wetlands. So on the right, you can see the plots being made by the SMAP passive measurements. This is a passive microwave radiometer at L-band. And then the active measurements are much higher resolution. But you can see with the Cygnus measurements, the GNSS reflectometry, it actually penetrates the, uh, uh, the vegetation. And so it can pick out the um, flat surfaces because it's forward scatter rather than back scatter um, uh, radar in effect. It's able to um, pick out the, the flat surface. They're kind of amplified. And so you can see all the tributaries of the Amazon basin, which aren't visible um, in, with other techniques. And we are planning to add a, a coherent channel that include, increases the resolution and uh, allows greater amplification of these weak signals. So this could be um, valuable for river width, lake altimetry, and bank inundation um, overflowing under forest canopies and mangrove forests can be measured. The, the water content can be measured underneath jungles. And then forest biomass. Um, so when you have a reflection of a signal, then the vegetation attenuates the uh, um, the signal. So it's difficult to separate it out, but that information is there. And uh, it's been shown that it doesn't saturate as uh, L-BAM backscatter does. Um, so by using longer integration times, it highlights that dependence. Um, so using um, artificial neural networks, people have been able to recover the, um, um, the biomass maps um, quite well across the globe. Uh, well, only not across the globe because we've only got Cygnus um, at lower latitudes, but it's it um, hydrogen SS will cover the whole globe, um, and um, been getting um, respectable results from the um, biomass. And then the evidence for soil freeze thaw, and this is something that Cygnus was unable to reach because of the lower latitudes, but TDS was able to reach the high latitudes, and so we have evidence there. And uh, what happens is the frozen soil changes the permittivity, and so you get a very different reflection um, once when it freezes and thaws. And uh, it seems to give a high similarity to SMAP uh, measurements. So you can see the plot there on the right that the, uh, um, the TDS measurements are in green and the SMAP freeze-thaw product is in red. So uh, uh, very closely correlated. So the science objectives of HydroGNSS are to exploit L-band satellite navigation signals to monitor Earth's water systems to a finer resolution and derive measurements linked to ECVs defined by GCOS. And so the parameters that we target are borrowing from the ECV requirements. Um, so the soil moisture, we're aiming for 0.04 meter cubed per, per meter cubed, inundation 90% cl classification, soil freeze thaw 90% classification accuracy, and forest biomass, we're aiming for 20%. And the resolution is, is, is maybe not as high as biomass wants, but it's, um, it's um, valuable for, uh, um, it's the, it hits the requirements for soil moisture inundation, soil freeze thaw. Um, we get, we have a sort of requirement of 25 kilometers, but as I said, when the um, surface that you're measuring goes flatter, then you see a finer resolution. And so we can see uh, um, as good as one kilometer under certain circumstances. And we're also um, targeting ocean wind speed and ice extent, which has been demonstrated with TDS and Cygnus. And we will also make the delay Doppler maps available at level one. Timeliness is 31 days standard, and then we're aiming for seven days goal for faster service. And for the longer term, we have a view towards less than 24 hours. The coverage is 80% of the globe in 30 days, and we've captured um, this information in the mission requirements document. Martin, sorry to interrupt. Is there yeah. one of those Zoom closed caption notifications on your screen by any chance? Um, oh, is it blocking out the top? Yeah, just a little bit. I wonder whether I can make it disappear. You should be able to close it. Is there an X? There isn't an X. I've moved. Um, hold on, I might be able to move it. Is that better if I do that? 
Uh, it is a little better. It's just cutting off the very top of the title. Right. I think it's probably Ooh, gone go. now. I think it's gone. Yes, yeah. thank you. I've dragged it out of the way, which means that I can no longer control my my sharing. But anyway, um, good. Um, it's good to have feedback that you're still there and listening to me. Um, so HydroGNSS addresses the niche in applications. Um, so here's a plot showing the uh, temporal and the um, spatial resolution. And you can see the different areas where soil moisture is valuable. Um, and HydroGNSS, a single satellite, is getting resolution maybe around 10 kilometers, maybe slightly better. Um, and then um, we can improve the resolution by um, including the coherent resolution where we get down to a, maybe as good as one kilometer. And then by adding more satellites, it improves the temporal. Um, and so the HydroGNSS Plus would be where we have uh, a number of satellites would get down to um, uh, daily coverage. Um, so this is the context for HydroGNSS with respect to other satellites. So um, um, I think many people will be aware of SMAP and SMOS, the ESA SMOS mission and NASA SMAP mission have uh, been highly valued uh, satellites for measuring soil moisture and ocean salinity in the case of SMOS. But both of them are um, past their design lifetime. Uh, and uh, we, we don't know how long they're going to last. SMOS has been up since 2009. Um, so there isn't a, a direct replacement for them. So uh, uh, people are, um, are valuing them very well and long may they last, but um, there may come a time when they're no longer around. There is a plan for a satellite in the, in the further future. Um, one of the Copernicus high priority missions is called SIMA and there's also Roselle, but that's um, 2026 and realistically it could be quite a bit later than that. So there is a gap um, coming up potentially in soil moisture. And then comparing technologies, I think part of the reason why there aren't follow-ons for SMOS and SMAP is because they're quite big and expensive and um, they are, they're highly valued, as I said, but SMAP was one ton and $1 billion. And so it's not quick to uh, justify more of those. Um, whereas when you compare a GNSS reflectometry technology, um, the Hydro GNSS satellite, 65 kilograms, and the budget 30 million um, is, is covered um, two craft um, and probably you'd need about eight craft to cover the, the, the uh, match, the SMOS coverage. Um, you're talking about a um, much, much cheaper approach and it's much more sustainable. It's something that could be topped up and continued um, uh, if, if larger satellites can't be justified, if it can be justified, it's a, it's a very complementary measurement. It's different technique to these other radiometry and radar methods. So a progression of the GNSSR measurements. Um, UK DMC3 was a secondary experiment. We stuck it on a satellite, it was an optical satellite. And we, we just uh, grabbed um, intermediate frequency sample data, 20 seconds at a time. And we got about 60 collections. So it really wasn't very much data, but it was enough to show that reflectometry worked, that the signals were strong enough. These incredibly weak signals bounced off the surface of the Earth and then picked up from space. They could actually be used to detect a geophysical imprint. And so that led on to TDS-1, um, which was funded by um, instruments funded by CUI and uh, UK Space Agency funded uh, uh, put funding in towards Tech Demo Sat 1, and that um, led to an instrument development that was able to generate these measurements on board in real time, um, four reflections at once, and uh, that uh, TDS generated this data um, for continuous delayed Doppler maps, and we did raw data collection at two minutes. Then DOT 1 is a, a very small um, opportunistic experiment that's running at the moment, and that is running the delay Doppler map on the new technology. It's got less capability for storing raw data. And then we have HydroGNSS, and that's going to be um, an upgraded version of the SGR-RESI. It's going to have 16 channels, 
it will be able to do dual frequency, dual polarization, and um, delay Doppler maps, plus coherent channels running at a fast rate. And typically, um, 60 seconds will be sample of raw data, um, but we will have capacity of up to 15 minutes. So um, the established GNSS reflectometry approach, as used on TDS and Cygnus, was using um, reflected power, diffuse unipolarized measurements um, for soil moisture. But then when we add these other capabilities, we're adding Galileo signals, and we're adding polarization information, and we're adding the coherent channel, and then we're adding the second frequency, um, all helps to separate out these different parameters the soil moisture, wetlands, and the roughness vegetation um, can be used these new um, measurements to help separate them out. Um, so in terms of um, measurements, um, in this diagram, the ones with the red asterisk are the ones which have been measured before by TDS, and the green ones are the ones which are being added to with um, HydroGNSS. So you can see we're adding Galileo, we're adding um, coherent channel, we're adding L5, we're adding the opposite polarization, um, and um, we'll have the data to support that, and we'll have a raw sample data, typically 60 seconds for um, research purposes at both frequency bands. So there's a lot more data available, but it should be recognized that the fundamental uh, science case is based on the, um, the, the, the left-hand circular uh, GPS and Galileo uh, reflections. So um, the approach that we're using is to target those using a zoom transform correlator to generate the delay Doppler maps. That's the same way we did with TDS and Cygnus, but we're adding Galileo signals and increasing signal to noise by combining and experimenting with longer integration times, uh, counting for secondary and data bits so that we'll get better signal to noise. And then we're adding a coherent channel um, where we have a single pixel which is sampled much, much faster, and it gives the complex values. So we've got the amplitude and the phase as well. And so that will give the that will exploit the um, resolution potential. And then we have dual frequency and dual polarization, which are a bit more adventurous. Um, so we're picking up a wide band signals and the dual polarization. So that calls for higher sampling rates. Um, we're using the same ZTC approach. We're optimizing the delay Doppler map settings according to the code. And then operational mode, we will normally collect delay Doppler maps for occasional collections of um, level 1A. So these are going to feed into the data levels. Um, where there's going to be um, level 1A and B are going to be delay Doppler maps. And then level 2 are the products that people, the users will want, which are soil moistures, et cetera. And then, um, there will be some integration into uh, grid and monthly maps for level three. Um, just a few words about the calibration. I won't go into great detail in this, but the, what we're doing is we're measuring the amplitude of the reflection off the surface. And what we're trying to do is to measure the reflection coefficient at a specular point. Or we're measuring the radar cross section if, if it's a um, diffuse scattering area which is a sigma, so it's gamma or sigma. They're very closely related. And so we need to be able to measure a reflected signal, but we also need to know what the incident signal is. So there's two halves to it. Um, and the calibration is addressing those to try and make sure that we are measuring the reflected signal and we know what the incident signal is. And so there's different techniques and we have um, different calibration activities. We have a black body load that allows you to measure what uh, a known noise um, gain gives you. And then we have targets over the ocean and over the Antarctic that we can use to help calibrate. And the other thing we're trying to calibrate is the antenna patterns, because that affects the measurement. The antennas patterns both on our uh, receive side and on the transmit uh, GPS or Galileo uh, transmit antenna patterns. And we've, as, as people have found that the more they spend on trying to correct these things, the better and better the measurements get. So in terms of the receiver power, we check against the black body load, an Antarctic target, and then we look at some of the second order effects such as bit distribution. 
and then we can apply that to the coherent and dual frequency. And then for the transmit power, we can either use a model or we can use ocean reflected signals, or we can use direct signals um, picked up by hydrogen SS itself, and then adjust for that to re retrieve the uh, specular point vector. And there's new challenges though, because the second frequency, we won't necessarily have the direct and, um, and ocean reflections and the opposite polarization. Again, we won't, it won't be so easy to use these techniques. So we do have challenges ahead of us with the calibration. And then it, this leads on to um, the inversion techniques. The um, ATBDs are being developed, algorithms, theoretical baseline that describe how the level two products are being generated. I won't go into detail here. There's just to say there's a baseline inversion using the, the measurements we know and then advanced techniques that are using the techniques, uh, the, the measurements that are brand new. And then we have the process of going through the measurement, the calibration, the validation, and then the passing to the users. And so we have to start thinking about how we're going to validate these, um, the test sites, um, the simulations, um, and the data sources, um, the best approach to uh, calibrate. And we have a target to try and achieve preliminary validation within six months after launch. And finally, just, yeah, just mentioning again, the challenges that we face with the new measurements. Um, there's, we've got good confidence with the L1E1 LHCP, but the, uh, the new measurements, L5E5 and the opposite polarization, um, we expect challenges and we will continue to work on these and collaborate with land and air campaigns to validate our approaches. Um, just a couple of words on the end-to-end -end simulator. It's an important part of the project. It's taking a lot of our time up, but it's, it's already showing its rewards. Um, ESA's approach is, is to make sure that we're able to show what's called scientific readiness level five. And that means that we have an end-to-end -end simulator in place. And the models um, can be used to model the reflections and it helps us understand the error terms. But it also is allowing us to develop and test our payload ground uh, segment, PDGS, which is quite complex because we have all these processes. And we can either use data that's simulated from the um, um, HSAVER simulator, or we've got data from TDS1 and DOT1, which we can use to pass through the system. And then the level two processes are provided by our science partners. And we're also working with science partners on the level one with some of the calibration activities. And then um, moving on to actually, how do we implement this, uh, the, this mission? And we've talked about the data. Um, so how do we implement it as a mission? And so we have a payload that's um, a new instrument that was based on the ones that we flew on TDS-1 and Cygnus. Um, we got, got a, a 13 dBi dual polarized dual frequency antenna, and it's compatible with GPS and Galileo. It's reconfigurable in orbit, so it will support new GNSSR measurements. Um, the platform is about 65 kilograms. Um, it's being designed for a two and a half year operational life plus a two year extension. So it's, it's designed for five years plus. Um, it's an agile platform. It's got star tracker attitude accuracy and xenon propulsion, so we can phase satellites. Um, it's um, dual redundant um, X-band 200 megabits per second downlink via Svalbard. So we have a ample capability to download data. We can, um, we've got much more than we need in terms of that capability. Um, we have um, payload data ground segment in, in Guildford based upon the processing that we did for TDS-1, which is um, presented to users at the Mervis website. We're um, SSTL's the prime, but we're working closely with the science team members. And um, SSTL will be opera, um, uh, running the operations and data product service delivery. And we're, we're running the launch and managing the launch campaign. And there is an option for an identical second satellite to enhance the scientific return. We're, we're making the case for that at the moment. Um, and here's a pictorial guide to the steps, the way that the program is broken down into reviews. Um, and so we are going through the key program gate reviews. Um, 
at the moment, we're sort of in the middle of a chart um, around PDR, and we're working on the end-to-end -end simulator SRL5, and we're beginning to produce um, hardware. Um, so come February, we start integrating the satellite. And then August next year, um, the satellite goes through um, environmental testing, so EMC and thermal vacuum, vibration. And then um, we do the final end-to-end -end testing of the, of, of the satellite before it's shipped out for the launch campaign. Um, we haven't got the launch date agreed, but we are working to around the August 2024 timeframe, August, September. We could be slightly earlier. Um, so we're in uh, la launch negotiations at the moment. And then launch um, roughly September 2024, and then commissioning six months. And then we release the data um, under an operational service six months after launch. And just to show some of the um, progress that's going on, that uh, the hardware is beginning to appear. Um, we've got um, detailed designs for the um, antenna panel um, being manufactured now. We've got low noise amplifiers that are arriving in the building literally today, uh, the engineering models. And the um, SGR Resi engineering model has been um, operated um, the last two or three weeks. And we're beginning to get delay Doppler maps um, using our new signal processing techniques as well. So to, um, I'm coming towards the end of the uh, uh, presentation now. And just something that we have been learning as we interact with the um, scientists, our team members, and the science advisory group is just that there is a pressing need for soil moisture sensing. Scientists, meteorologists, and others are increasingly using global soil, soil moisture measurements from space. So um, accurate weather forecasts are increasingly dependent on soil moisture measurements, particularly over large land masses. And soil moisture is needed for flood warning services and agriculture, subsidence, permafrost sensing, climate modeling. Um, and ESA, SMOS, and NASA SMAP satellites are already providing soil moisture through passive L-band radiometry measurements. And these measurements are widely used, but both satellites are past the end of their design life and there's no immediate replacements. These, these can be large satellites, in particular SMAP had a six meter antenna which makes it quite vulnerable up in space. And the mission cost $1 billion. So they are hard technologies to sustain for the future. And so, but there is a recognized urgent need for a continuity of their services. And GNSS reflectometry is increasingly recognized as an alternative technology to a microwave radiometer. Um, it's, it's lower cost to achieve the same coverage and it is achieving higher resolution. But the measurements are different. Um, they are forward scatter measurements, different to radar, different to radiometry. So it's um, providing some unique benefits, in, including the ability to sense under vegetation. So um, the ESA Scout mission, currently we're building one satellite, and that's proving the technology and the delivery of this science. But a follow-on constellation would provide the global temporal coverage as um, equivalent to SMOS around update every three days, but at an improved resolution of better than 25 kilometers. So we see the future as um, um, two ESA scout missions. We are um, um, working on um, the argument for the second scout mission and um, augmented by um, a follow-on constellation of six satellites, which will give eight satellites covering the whole globe. We held a workshop in um, February in 2022, um, just, a, just a couple of months ago, and um, we presented the mission and um, our scientists presented the, uh, um, the level two processes, but we also had participation from the data users. And we had um, people from um, Met Office, ECMWF, um, um, Copernicus Climate Change, um, service and the um, ESA um, CCI. Um, there's a video available of the workshop online. And uh, the users identified hydrogen SS as um, uh, potentially filling a valuable role of uh, providing continuity for SMOS SMAP and offering new forward scatter measurements valuable for essential climate variables. 
Um, it was in particular the Met Office that highlighted the importance of fast delivery of data, um, obviously for weather forecast and flood sensing, but also pointed out that if, if it can be adopted by the meteorological users, then it will be adopted for climate sensing as well. Um, and GNSS reflectometry it has the lower cost, um, robust, robust technology. It's a sustainable approach and it addresses the future soil and moisture needs. So the original science approval from the um, um, advisory committee, ACHIO, in 2020 was for two hydrogen SS satellites. Um, but we have funding for a single hydrogen SS satellite, and that enables the GNSS alpha um, land sensing. It enables all these um, innovations that I've been talking about, and it's it's good for capturing the, um, the slow dynamic hydrological and biomass processes, especially at the higher latitudes, which are obviously very important. Um, but there is this option for a second hydrogen SS satellite, which actually fits within the scout envelope. And if that is enabled, that we can build this efficiently using two satellites, which can be launched together, phased at 180 degrees. Um, and, and this can be done very efficiently. We've, we've already ordered the parts, so it's um, possible to do this at a, a relatively low cost delta to what we are building at the moment. And two satellites offer significant advantages. It sets the framework for the constellation, the orbit phasing, cross-satellite calibration of measurements. And then it, it, um, it doubles the coverage. The second satellite improves the coverage from 30 days to 15 days. And in fact, statistically, the, the, the mean revisit time is a lot better. It's um, 3.8 days for one satellite, but then it improves to better than three days for two satellites. And the temporal monitoring resolution of the dynamic processes improves significantly soil moisture inundation, freeze thaw transition in permafrost, forest disturbances, ice, all better sample with two satellites and improves the uh, scientific return. So concluding my presentation, HydroGNSS uses GNSS reflectometry to target key variables, soil moisture inundation, freeze thaw and biomass. And HydroGNSS observes a high latitude forests and disturbances where the ESA Biomass Explorer is, is unable to operate. So it, it's a good complement to the biomass uh, mission. And it addresses um, the um, identified user needs. So WMO has already identified the need for reflectometry in its WIGOS 2040 um, vision. And um, the GCOS EC, um, ECVs. And um, some there's some urgency because the, um, the soil moisture and freeze thaw is not adequately measured in the long term. So SMAP, SMAP and SMOS are now operating past their design life and we are facing a potential gap. So um, HydroGNSS is a showcase for GNSS reflectometry and new measurements, but it's more than that. It's, it's also taking measurements of these ECV related uh, variables. And the second satellite operation will double the coverage and improve the, the return. And it prepares the way for a constellation of eight satellites which could cover the globe every three days. Um, this is a more sustainable in, um, approach compared to ex, um, other um, technologies. And it provides immediate benefits for weather forecasting and flood alerting, as well as providing measurements for the uh, climate. And um, it links closely to the COP26 space enabled net zero in UK national space strategy. Monitoring the climate variables helps as we tackle climate change and see the results of our work. And that's the end of my talk. Thank Brilliant. you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. Fascinating stuff, really interesting. Thank you for that. Um, there, there are a number of questions to, uh, that have come up, if I, if I may post some of those to you Martin. Um, so, so there's a couple of so a couple of different areas here. The first set of questions are really around the sort of future for these kind of missions. Um, so, so there's a couple of related questions, so I'll, I'll pose them together if, if that's okay. Um, the first is whether whether these sort of microsatellites, are, they, are these the future of these sorts of missions? Are they going to, to replace the, the larger missions in your view? Um, I think in a word, no, no, right. I don't think so. I think no, there's okay. always going to be a need for 
for some of these missions you know the um i think you know some of the the, the measurements which are taken by the big satellites are incredibly valuable um i, I think there would be an uproar if if people thought that small satellites would take their place i think it's it's a case by case basis and um i think in this case that there, there is a strong case i, I think it's it's a harder sell in other areas. The, 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 the obvious advantage of small satellites is they're low cost, which means that you could put up a constellation, you get the spatial and temporal resolution. And that is very special. But yeah. it should be recognized the value that some of these big satellites um, with the big apertures um, um, are, are, are taking, they're, they're, they're vital. And so I think probably the future is, is, is a combination um, where it makes sense that you have a backbone with these sort of national or international missions. And then where it makes sense, they can be augmented by um, small satellites uh, mm. that are taking higher temporal and, and spatial resolution. At the moment, you've got Copernicus with these big missions. And I think really they, they, they could do with augmenting with um, um, smaller satellites where it makes sense. Yeah. Great, thanks, Martin. Um, you mentioned on one of your slides the the concept of a hydro GNSS plus, which was twelve satellites. I mean, is that is that something that you see as a realistic possibility in the future, or is that sort of just a an, a concept that? To, well, to I think if you there is a precedent for this, and that is um, radio occultation, um, where quite definitely you have um, twelve satellites taking measurements of the atmosphere, um, that, that and. That has been very successful. So, so um, for those people who aren't familiar, it's very similar to what we're doing with the reflectometry. Um, the satellite in orbit picks up the um, GNSS signals as they go through the atmosphere, measure the bending angle. And from the bending angle, you can recover the temperature, pressure, and humidity of the atmosphere. And you can also measure the um, ionosphere, a uh, total electron count. And that has been incredibly successful. Um, um, there are institutional uh, satellites that take measurements of that, um, the graphs payload on the NETOP one. And there are also um, uh, institutional constellation called FOMOSAT-7, Cosmic-2, um, which is a US um, Taiwanese constellation. And there's Chinese um, institutional missions. But interestingly, there are also commercial satellites that are topping up the measurements. So there's three companies, there's Spire Global, there's GeoOptics, and there's um, uh, Planet IQ that are have commercial um, um, measurements and it's they are able to add to the sort of backbone measurements and that has come up with a, um, a model that works where there is a scientific um, community that agrees to purchase these and but they purchase them on the basis that they are released um, as public open data so Nice. Um, it, it's kind of a system that works, and and maybe something like that could work with reflectometry as well. Cool. That, that kind of brings on to the, the next set of questions around the the access to the data. Um, so there's a question about where where um, where's the data generated by the mission to be stored, and, and what are the over, overall estimated volumes of raw and processed data coverages? Um, well, it's going to be um, uh, when we're talking about the, the full raw data there, there's, there's many gigabytes um but actually when it's um then when it's processed down into the level two products which is what we expect most people to use um then it's quite small it's 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 small amounts of data um we're making both available we're making level one delayed up the maps available and we're making level two available it's it's I mean, this, this, is, this is an institutional mission. Um, it's free and open data. Uh, level naught may be a bit more controlled. There's some sensitivity to the unprocessed data, but that's going to be the minority of the data. It's, it's majority is going to be level one and level two. Um, and it's hosted um, at SSTL in Guildford, and we're setting up gigabyte links um, to the internet. Um, but the, the data is owned by ESA. Um, and uh, we're still working through um, all the data access details, but it's um, it's going to be made available um, via a web portal. Um, so we've we've already had um, a web portal for the TDS one data, which has been very successful with hundreds of um, users. And so we're we're sort of basing it on that. Um, I think that's answered most of the questions. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. 
Um, a question about calibration. So, so are the GNSS reflectometry measurements calibrated using ESA, SMOS, and NASA SMAP data as well as ground truth measurements? Um, certainly, they will be um, cross compared with um, a SMOS and SMAP. I think that would be the ideal um, if if they're still operating when the hydro GNSS goes up. I think that would be the the plan. Plan A would be to use SMAP and SMOS as the um, um, calibration over the globe. But we also have um, alternative approaches. Um, and we have one or two calibration sites. There's the San Luis Valley in, um, in Colorado that Cygnus has been using. And I think some of our scientists have worked closely with the Cygnus team. Um, so, and we've also got a site in Finland and um, we're working closely with um, Wolfgang Wagner with the International Soil Moisture Network. Um, so that provides a database for the global soil moisture. Um, biomass is one of the hardest ones because there isn't really such a, um, I mean, there are models, but um, we're, we're lacking forest biomass. So we're looking at Gabon, um, which I think is gonna be used for the biomass mission as a calibration site, but it probably needs to be expanded to, um, to use for hydrogen SS. So there are some challenges ahead. Thank you. Um, a question about um, coverage. So, so you mentioned the temporal coverage, but what, what latency are you targeting for actionable data to be available after measurement? Okay, well, bearing in mind that this is a low cost rapid schedule mission, um, we haven't put this as our top requirement, but we are aware that the future use is going to be for weather applications, in which case it needs to be a matter of hours. Mm -hmm. um, to start with, we, we, we've got a requirement of 31 days, and then we've got a target of less than seven days. We may end up layering our data where we have um, a fast data delivery that's kind of track based. And then we have a gridded um, um, delivery that's um, going to be a bit longer delay. Um, and, and there's certain bits of auxiliary data that we can use to improve our measurements. Um, but um, I think we're, we're, we're very conscious that there are there is a large, um, significant user community that wants the data quickly. And so we are taking that into account. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions about applications of the data. So are there some case studies where these data have been used in environmental applications? Um, there are, there are, there are um, um, I think, again, we're fortunate that, that, that Cygnus has kind of paved the way. So there's, there's quite a bit of, um, um, there's quite a bit of usage of, of Cygnus. And I think there's a lot of references on the web um, accessible via the web from uh, um, uh, Cygnus for soil moisture. And there, 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 there's some people um, connected with uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory who are looking at the flood response as well. Um, freeze thaw, not yet, um, because they don't, Cygnus doesn't cover freeze thaw, although they're able to do some testing over the Andes um, and the Himalayan um, plateau. Um, and um, biomass, not yet. So, uh, um, but the soil moisture, yes, I think it's, um, and inundation is that there, there are some applications where they're exploring it. Thanks. Um, just, just one final question. The, um, I mean, the focus here is on, um, is on sort of natural change and, and detecting natural changes, but is there, are there any applications of this kind of data to monitor human activity, um, sort of changes as a result of human activity? Um, uh, uh, yes, yes, there are. Um, um, there, there's several. I mean, this is a, this is a, in effect, GNSS reflectometry is a, is a, is a, is, is a kind of radar. And you think of all the things that SAR can be used for, um, a lot of those things um, GNSS reflectometry can do. Um, um, some of them, um, I mean, one of the things that um, Cygnus has done is, is, is monitoring the, um, the plastic buildup in the oceans um, by seeing the plastic affects the um, behavior of the surface of the ocean. And so it's possible to sort of, um, um, uh, sort of extrapolate and work out where the plastic is from the behavior. So that's one area. I think with hydrogen SS, another interesting one is that although biomass is um, 
really um, ECV wants it as a yearly product, you, you can actually generate it faster. And so it's possible to spot forest disturbance, um, perhaps from fires, um, using um, the, uh, the, the measurements from reflectometry. Um, and I think there's, there's, there's other effects which are a bit more tangential, like, for example, we can, we can see some man-made interference in the um, hellbound, which is less of interest to uh, most of this community, but there are other people who are interested in that. And thank you. I think that's that's probably it for questions. So thank you very much for that, Martin. And thank you again for a fascinating talk and for taking time to share that with us. Um, just to, to remind everybody that we recorded the session um, and that will be av made available on the YouTube channel and on the website. Um, and please do subscribe to that YouTube channel if you haven't already done so. Um, the next webinar in the series will be on Friday the 10th of June at 11 o'clock um, and that will be presented by Liz Kent on making old data more useful. So please do make a note of that one and book your place now, uh, again via the website. Um, and with that, I think we're, we're probably done. So thank you again to Martin um, and thank you all for attending and we will close the session there. So enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks all. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Martin. That's great. Thanks, Martin. And thanks, Adrian. Well, thank you. Uh, lots of applications, some of which aren't, aren't even properly understood and known yet, I guess. There are. I didn't mention the Greenland ice melt. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, exactly. <laughs> uh, people have been using it for that. They can measure ice thickness as well. Um, there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a whole load of stuff. That this can do. Well, the ocean plastic ones, fascinating. So, that, that, uh, are people actually doing doing that? Are they? Yes, there are. There's a, there's a, there's papers on the on the web. I mean, it's a it's a little bit vicarious, but it's better than yeah. than not having anything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the, the the resolution of these is 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 you mentioned twenty five kilometers. Is it's, it? It's very difficult to nail down the resolution, and um, you kind of have to um, you have to um, take what the, the surface of the Earth gives you. So yeah. when you're over the ocean, it's it's scattering, and it, it gives you about twenty five kilometers. So you're um, limited by the um, chip length of the, the GPS code. Mm -hmm. But when you go over a, a you find a flat surface, for example, a river under a, a forest um, or a jungle. The river is really flat and it 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 actually um, causes um, very strong reflections. It becomes coherent and then you're down to the Fresnel zone, which for GPS is about 500 meters um, for um, L band. Um, so it was that sort of made everyone's jaw drop when we started seeing this in the data. Um, we, we only sample it once a second, which is about six and a half, seven kilometer resolution. So there's a lot more potential there when you've got the right surface. Um, with the Fresnel zones, you get this kind of sink shape, you get these side lobes, so you, it's not easy to untangle, but the resolution's there. Yeah. Actually, Martin, I noticed in the chat that, um, that Andy Turner asked, he says he's interested in the provenance data of the data processing. Does that? Um, the provenance data of a data processing, what does that mean exactly? <laughs> I'm not sure, and I for reproducibility. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, we, we're publishing. I'm, I'm. I'm still not quite sure I understand the question, but I'll try and answer it. Um, so, um, we we will be having traceable processes. We've got um, published. We will be publishing the algorithm theoretical baseline documents. And we will be letting people have access to the level 1B. So um, I, I think um, hopefully that gives enough visibility that people can reproduce the results and they'll know that when we've reprocessed the level 1B, it will be labeled so that there won't be any nasty surprises. Um, so uh, we recognize it's quite complex to trace these things and, and people can waste a lot of time when data has changed when it was reprocessed. So we will, we will try and make it as traceable as possible. <laughs>